thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, today I have with me Alejo. Alejo is one of our uh, core devs. Uh, he happens to also be a resident of Argentina uh, and he lives in Buenos Aires. And if people are familiar with Argentina, they've had uh, years, if not decades, of uh, issues around inflationary currencies. And that has created uh, challenges economically for the residents of Argentina. And they have become somewhat of a crypto centric hub in some ways, uh, actually looking to use crypto and potentially what could be considered its original use case of having a um, money independent of the state. And so today I just wanted to talk to Alejo, understand kind of more about Argentina, more about the challenges that he faces on a day to day basis, as well as just how cryptocurrency plays a role locally. Uh, what people use it for, how they use it, uh, some of the challenges around crypto, um, so on and so forth. So with that, maybe I'll start off with my first question, which is you've been uh, in Argentina for your entire life. That's right. Right. How long has it been where the instability of the currency has been front of mind uh, in Argentina? Since I since I can even remember. It has always been like that. We, um, uh, you know, Argentina uh, as a country is always put as an example on the other side of the, spe of the spectrum of Japan. It's like both countries, Jap Japan is a small island, Argentina is a vast territory, lots of natural resources. The economy of Japan is doing great and our economy is, is has always been doing bad, or at least for the past 40 years or 50 years or maybe more than that. So it's a, it's a uh, rare avis or rare avis. Uh, it's a special case which is studied because um, it's hard to understand how come a country which is, again, so rich full in resources has been doing so bad for the past uh, maybe six decades. Yeah, I mean, if... Um People aren't familiar. It's interesting if you look at Argentina. Uh, I want to say it was given the moniker of uh, the Paris of the That's Americas right. yeah. uh, because in the 1930s, I believe it was the largest uh, GDP in the Americas mm -hmm. and one of the most prosperous countries because of all the natural resources and its ability to yeah. export. But you guys have had a pretty uh, tumultuous, and we don't have to cover the whole last hundred years of history, but mm -hmm. you've had somewhat of a tumultuous both political um, history with different forms of um, state-owned companies, state welfare, uh, sort of social systems put on the um, country, and there's been back and forth. There's to, to say there's been a lot of turmoil. I think yes. I think would would be accurate. Maybe um, I, I can. There's about a hundred history years of history to unfold. Maybe yeah. you want to like give the high points. Um, um, the way I can summarize it is um, what makes make makes it special for Argentina as opposed to other countries from Latin America is that the European immigrant uh, it, it has a uh, a primary role. It's like Everyone is descendant either from Italy or Spain, mainly, maybe some Germans, maybe some Portuguese. Um, so the economy was doing really well uh, in the after the um, after the first uh, uh, World War and uh, even after the Second World War. Uh, we were like the main one of the main uh, exporters of of of. Um, of um, I don't know um, all the um, um, what you call it um, all, uh, all the seeds like um, um, agriculture grain agriculture yes. corn yes. beef yes wine right are the big so exports at the time of the Second World War Argentina exploded uh, because uh, the economy exploded because of that uh, but then uh, I guess the uh, the the turn the the, the 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 turning point started with Perón, which was like a populism le leader that we had, who started changing the uh, making radical changes. He was elect. I mean, the reason why he was elected was because he gained a lot of traction for for from from the workers. So that's why 
and that's 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 what is what introduced populism into the country. Uh, this is like a debate, and depends on depending on who you speak with, uh, it's gonna tell you that we are lucky to have Peron, and other people would say that was our our course. So, um, like always in politics, it's um, uh, I don't know. It, it, it's uh, uh, there are always two views on that. Um, well, and, and Perón kind of came into power, then went out of power, then came back into power. That's so right. Yeah, a little bit of history there, but um, but a he lot introduced. Of... I mean, he introduced ideas like uh, he started giving away for free to the kids uh, bicycles and. Uh, I, I mean that's just a silly example, but there there were many many things like that that uh, that helped him to gain even more and more power, but changed the the cultural focus 180 degrees. So many generations or or some generations were born under that idea and uh, to kind some of entitlement. Yeah, yeah, from the state. Yeah. So I mean the the, the summary though in terms of the impact on the money system is that. The, the government sort of has taken a very large role yeah. in society. And with that, they're using effectively printing of money yeah. as a mechanism of funding these expenditures. Yeah. So that's kind of where we get into inflation. And in the last uh, 10 years or so, mm -hmm. we've had this new tool in our sort of toolkit that you guys have uh, started to utilize, which is crypto. Yeah. Um, you know, so maybe speak a little bit about when was the first time you heard about Bitcoin in Argentina? When were some of the first use cases yeah. uh, that you saw people using Bitcoin for? So um, I should also say that uh, the uh, developers community in, in, in Argentina is, is very big. And it was, it was an early adopter in terms of, uh, I mean, we have a, many uh, crypto developers or blockchain developers all around the world. Um, which are part of, of maybe the mo most uh, renowned uh, projects are from, from Argentina. And also, um, yeah, so maybe, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, we are talking about 2014, I started uh, hearing about uh, Bitcoin, basically, and, and then Ethereum quickly uh, came uh, and everyone was speaking about that. When when were when was the first sort of use case or when's the first time you bought crypto? What did you use it for? Why did you buy it? I can see like two different use cases in in Argentina. Um, many people is using it as a as an investment um, feature. Like um, maybe they, they speculate like any other stock or or or, or any any other uh, financial uh, asset that you can you can trade. I mean, but also many other people is using it to as as, as a reserve of, of of value as a store of value because it's easier to. Uh, I mean, we didn't speak about this, but uh, since uh, access to the to to hard uh, currencies like the U.S. dollar is uh, is not easy for us. Uh, so uh, I would say that maybe that's probably the, the main use case for crypto is having access to uh, an, a stable coin which is backed by by the U.S. U.S. dollar. Okay, so if that makes sense. Yeah, so kind of like a offshore bank account in some ways is yeah. how people are, are yeah. utilizing crypto. It's, 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 uh, I mean, it's re relatively easy to open uh, an account in any crypto exchange, and uh, you can uh, you can use your your local pesos to to and, and trade them for some stable coin of whatever you choose, and uh, that didn't exist before. So uh, accessing uh, and and also. Uh, that that introduces like a different because I mean in, in when you have an economy with high inflation and and there is no uh, easy access to or, or or maybe I should say it's forbidden to purchase uh, uh, a hard currency like like the U.S. dollar because that's that's how it is. Then people start looking for alternative ways of of. Uh, exchanging the pesos for for the the dollar in this case because they don't want to lose more value. So uh, there are different ways, but uh, crypto. Uh, I think that that's that that's uh, the main reason why it was boom. It, it is still booming in, in in our country because it's it's so much easier for us to uh, 
to exchange the pesos for for the U.S. dollar. So if you're using it typically as a store of value, then so you you know set up a wallet, you set up on an exchange, maybe you get Belo or Lemon Wallet, right? Yeah. Um, you get some Bitcoin in that wallet. Now Bitcoin fees aren't necessarily low all mm-hmm. the time relative to prices in Argentina. So what do you do then in terms of actually using it once you have it as a store of value? If you want to move it back, are you converting it back to pesos through a local exchange and then using those pesos to go buy uh, goods and services? Kind of what is that, that yeah. use like? There are different use cases. Uh, probably, I mean, uh, nobody wants to go back to pesos once after <laughs> after you uh, you sell your pesos. You probably don't want to go back. You, um, there are some exchanges that are actually uh, giving you some rewards in, in um, I mean, th- th- like, for instance, they can give you like a debit card where you convert your pesos to USDC and then uh, you can use a debit card in Argentina uh, where you would spend your USDC, which are instantly converted into pesos at the exchange rate uh, of whatever that day it is. Uh, so that's uh, like a good use case because you're, you have your pesos which are in USD or USDC, but uh, you can still use them. Mm, okay. Um, so nobody's spending Bitcoin directly. Then. No, no, not really. So so Bitcoin is kind of a store of value, yeah. and then it's a mechanism to get access to dollar-denominated stable tokens. Yes. So you mentioned USDC. Mm-hmm. So USDC exists in different chains. Yeah. Um, what has been the experience in Argentina in terms of what blockchains are popular to use USDC on mm-hmm. and kind of what challenges have kind of made some chains become more popular or less popular uh, over time relative to USDC? Yeah, I mentioned USDC, but I should also say that probably USDT is the most uh, used uh, together with USDC. Um, I think that... Uh, um, let me um, let me tell you this story. So um, B- Binance, they have a really nice um, peer-to-peer network, uh, and by peer-to-peer, I mean peers, meaning persons, where you can, uh, if if you have a, a Binance account, you can uh, buy and sell USDT uh, directly without the without any intervention. So um, that is used uh, i mean it's binance who who um keeps us uh, a sort of um they would lock your your crypto and and then you you, you um connect with another with other person who wants to either buy or sell and and, and then the, the trade is is finalized um as to which blockchain is used uh, i don't think that nobody really cares to be honest well, no, uh, nobody really cares so from kind of the arc that I've heard in, in Buenos Aires, you, you bring up Binance, was when people were trading on chain and trying to do sort of settlement in USDT, USDC, mm-hmm. the original chain that was used was Binance because Ethereum was sort of too expensive. So um, it sounds like what you're describing is a little bit different than on-chain activity, which is basically uh, Binance is allowing Binance users to effectively lock in their crypto and then do an intra Binance exchange. That's correct. Yeah. So they're just rejiggering their ledger internally to Binance with no yeah. actual on chain activity taking place. That's totally right. Yes. But yes. but earlier on, from from what I understand about it, is um, the Binance smart chain was sort of the original popular mechanism before they came up with this uh, intra Binance settlement layer. Yes. Um, for, for doing uh, USDT, USDC type transactions. Yeah, I would say that Binance was a, a pioneer in Argentina. Um, it, it, it was the main, it was the first big player and probably s- still the one. I mean, other big crypto exchanges, they don't have much uh, adoption in, in Argentina. And I believe it's pretty much the same in other Latin American countries. There are many uh, local uh, startups that are no longer startups who started uh, that, that that have become uh, crypto exchanges, which are also getting a lot of traction, like the one we just uh, mentioned, like Lemon and, and some other ones. Okay. So in terms of Binance, I, I also heard, and maybe can confirm or not, with BSC, 
uh, people were doing on-chain transactions. And then out, as it became kind of popular in Argentina and the fees went up circa, you know, 2021, 20, yeah. uh, people kind of had to stop using it transactionally because they were having to pay dollar or more fees for mm-hmm. the transaction, which didn't really make sense. And then from also what I understand is then people started to move over to Tron in lieu of BSC. Um, would you say that's accurate or? Uh, <laughs> well, as far as I know, um, again, um, from um, I would say that most of, of, of the people involved in, in crypto, uh, they don't pay much attention to the underlying technology or the underlying network or the blockchain network. Um, there, there are, I know many users that are more advanced, but are maybe a, a very limited number that they would use even different DeFi protocols and um, and they could use Polygon or Tron or, or, or some of those. But for the majority, the only thing, I mean, the, like the biggest use case would be to go to Binance and, and use your pesos and uh, exchange them for, for, for USDT. Uh, which uh, which is the underlying technology? I mean, it's, it's very little people care about that. So it's interesting, though. Kind of what you're describing to me as the current state of affairs is that Argentinians, from what I understand, have very difficult time getting offshore banking access. Yeah. So um, maybe you can speak to the difficulty associated with getting a you know, a US dollar bank account outside of Argentina. Mm -hmm. Um, But it kind of seems like Binance is serving as an easier mechanism for effectively getting a US dollar denominated bank account outside of Argentina, which just isn't sort of falling within the the rules that prevent people from just opening up a bank account somewhere else. Yes, and also, um, as you can expect, maybe um, the government has started um, not Millet's government, but the government before, um, they started chasing Binance and they wanted to put more controls and, and, and the, um, I mean, what we have, the um, AFIP, which is the uh, equ- equivalent to the IRS here. Uh, they they try to start um, putting investigations and, and, and gain control basically of, of Binance because they, they saw that there were many, many people they found a way out of of, of the uh, of the economy to to exchange their pesos for the USC and and the government couldn't couldn't control it. So yeah, it's it's a easy way, a quick way to uh, let's say not only get rid of your pesos, but it's like having an offshore account. Right. So I I would also then posit from kind of what you're saying, the ability to use Binance mm-hmm. as a workaround of getting a USD offshore account only exists with the uh, tacit, if not implicit, uh, allowance of the government of Argentina. So if you had the old government in charge, maybe you wouldn't be able to get Binance accounts anymore. Yes, I I think that, uh, I mean, uh, not Millet, but uh, if, if the uh, previous government would have would have been reelected, then probably it would have been harder and harder to uh, keep on using uh, Binance accounts. Um, the only thing I should say is that um, you have to keep in mind that um, for a, for a normal, I mean, any guy in Argentina, luckily now the inflation is going down. But keep in mind that we, I mean, past the last year we even had like two hundred. Uh, percent of inf- yearly inflation or even more than that so and uh, an inflation means uh, the US dollar uh, the exchange rate keeps go- going growing up uh, and and uh, it's even I mean your pesos have uh, they, they they lose value and and uh, if you if you have your pesos in USD then you're safe so there are different ways to get to get uh, i mean before crypto there were the, the main mechanism to to get uh, to exchange your pesos for for usd was to go to the black market or or the gray market and uh pay whatever the price it it, it was there's another mechanism which is more legal if you want uh, it's actually legal and which is you go to the stock um 
to the financial market and where you can purchase bonds uh, which are emitted emitted in uh, I mean state bonds uh, which are emitted in in hard currency in USD and that's another way where you can with your pesos you can purchase your, those bonds then you sell them in the market and and you get dollars in return uh, so depending on where you go the exchange rate is different and then crypto came as another alternative to this uh, to this maze or, or, or different uh, ways of, of getting dollars so there's another exchange rate that is uh, that that is uh, like the result of, of this uh, game of, of uh, and, and different ways to, of to uh, currency control. Yeah. 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 Is, is this not the, is this called the blue dollar market? Is that? <laughs> yeah, that's the blue, mar- that's the blue dollar market. Yeah. yeah. So what that, I mean, the blue dollar market is, is the, let's say it's the one where you go in the street and, and, or, and, and where you, you may go to, uh, or to the um, gray market, like, like we said, and uh, you would, Give your pesos to someone, and they will give you USD. Okay, what what's kind of the spread between the the uh, real market and the gray market? Well, Our, the gray market is probably the real market in this case, yeah, versus the government market, right? Yeah, but um, so you don't. I mean, <laughs> the funny thing is, it all depends on uh, because in Argentina, long term probably means one, one month okay so you, you can't foresee or, or or make plans more more than one month because change uh, things change very quickly the reason why i'm i'm saying that is because last year the, the spread was more than a hundred percent so the official rate was maybe um let's say it was 300 uh, pesos for one for one dollar and in the uh, and the blue dollar or the blue market was maybe was about 700 so it was more than twice nowadays uh the spread has gone uh it's much more smaller so we are talking about um i think it's around 950 that's like the uh, official rate and you can get a, a usd for uh 1300 uh, more or less. Okay. Um, well, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, within the last 10 years, this was like four to one, was it not? The short story is like this. Um, we had a president in in the 90s uh, who um, managed to, because we have always lived with inflation, but there was a period where we had uh, Menem, that is the name of this guy, who he managed to control the inflation and he... Um, he had a law that would say that one peso was equ- equivalent for one USD. And that was successful. Uh, and it worked for something like around maybe seven or eight or ni- nine years. Um, so there was no inflation and uh, one peso less, uh, had the same value as, as, as one dollar. At one point, everything exploded because uh, the reserves for of of, of USD uh, were not enough to to shield that uh, that rate exchange rate of one of one. So that's that's when uh, from one day to another we went from one to four, mm-hmm. and since then um, we um, it, it has been growing going up and up and up. So from one one to four that was in two thousand and one. And today, in 2024, instead of 1 to 4, we have um, 1 to uh, 1,300. Wow. So 400, 300 times yeah. in 20 years. Yeah. So basically, 99.7% of the value went away. Yeah. That's correct. That's uh, it's pretty rough. Yeah. So practically speaking, then from day to day in Argentina, um, when you go to the store, mm-hmm. right, you have your crypto person, so you have probably a Binance account, yeah, um, or you might have one of these um, cards that converts. 
So what what is your interaction like when you go to buy things with crypto? Are you doing it with some sort of intra Binance uh, payment process? Are you mm -hmm. doing it with this uh, crypto debit card? How are you using uh, crypto in Argentina? Yeah, the the the, the cases are, I I am more familiar with are. Uh, crypto exchanges like Lemon that they would give you a card and then you would use that like a normal, uh, a regular debit debit card. And um, and I mean, the, uh, the the shop owner, um, I mean, for them, it's, it's irrelevant. Uh, they just, uh, because at the time of, of making the, uh, the payment and that is converted into pesos. So it's more like uh, how the uh, exchanges are are managing this uh, this uh, exchange between pesos and crypto. Right. If that so, makes sense. Yeah. So so it's interesting as I'm looking at that. Right. Um, there's a dependency then on you know because Lemon is going to be a regulated financial entity uh, mm -hmm. because they are custodianed provider yeah uh, so they both hold dollars USDC, bitcoin etc for users um they also are doing exchanges so mm -hmm. i don't know if they run their exchange directly i believe they integrate with other exchanges but that's sort of a regulated business and having um sort of access to the conversion markets between crypto and pesos is going to be a regulated activity too um and then the ability for users to sign up with either Lemon or Binance or whatever to get crypto is also going to be sort of a regulatable activity. Yeah. So although you guys kind of have a alternative system here, it is completely at the um, grace of the <laughs> uh, current uh, administration that's allowing you to continue to use uh, crypto as a mechanism to try to maintain a uh, value of earned assets. Yes, you're absolutely right about that. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, in, in countries with high inflation and, and, and where there is a, a limited asset like the USD in our case, then people always find a way to uh, to trick the system and, and, and get access to, to that limited resource. So um, if they forbid crypto, then uh, s I'm sure that people will will find out find out other way. But um, yeah, so far it's it's really nice uh, for us to have that uh, that w uh, mean of exchange. Right. I think in in other countries in earlier times, like Ecuador, mm -hmm. uh, when they had hyperinflation, they um, before they fully dollarized, they um, implicitly dollarized because people just started importing dollars for goods and literally yeah. would trade hard currency in dollars. So if you went to Ecuador, you would bring U.S. dollars with you. Exactly. And you would just spend U.S. dollars. And then it was sort of the uh, tourism and export business that was the import mechanism for those dollars. But the whole economy literally went to physical dollar bills is, yeah. is kind of what happened in Ecuador. Yeah, I, um, I, I guess it's the same pattern everywhere. Like um, while I was listening to you, uh, I in, in Venezuela uh, happened something like that. And also in Argentina where um, we have lots of tourists that came. And um, now again, the, um, the, um, the, um, uh, there's no much difference between the, the, uh, the official exchange rate and, and what, what you get on, on, on the uh, on the black market. But when the time, I mean, back back at the time when it was more than double than any tourist guy like you, if you were if you went to Buenos Aires, uh, if it depends, I mean, if you if you were if you go to the bank, then the bank will give you the uh, I, I mean, you need to to get pesos with your with your um, US dollars <clears throat> in order to make transactions locally and you would get uh, a very bad exchange rate but instead if you go to the black market then you would get more than twice so you can imagine uh, all the things that uh, I mean that that triggers um, many different kinds of uh, I don't know behaviors and uh, the black market explodes and and um, the government tried to they made different attempts like at one point, if you have if you had a 
a card, a, um, a debit card or or a um, credit card from not not a local one, then they would give you a special exchange rate. So that was like meant to uh, to enforce to this. Uh, tourists, uh, ex- uh, foreign tourists to, uh, they, they, to go they, to the they, black market. They would get the good rate, and then the locals yeah, would get the bad not, rate. It basically. was not the best rate, but it was it's but it was not the official rate. Right. Interesting. So so it's interesting to me, though. It, it seems like, obviously, uh, Malay has come in. He's more sort of pro-crypto, maybe a little less populist uh, in some regards. Yes. Right. Uh, he's creating a lot of chaos because sort of dismantling old systems Mm -hmm. or changing things can can do that um would you anticipate that there might be a backlash against that you might end up (laughs) in the same sort of um uh, patron like uh system again well um i can't help but putting my hopes in, in in my answer um i am i am Let's say I am the kind of guy who wants him to to uh, to suc- to uh, succeed and 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 to make the change he started uh, implementing uh, in the country. So, but I mean, let's say maybe half of the population is against that. So, I guess it all depends on. Uh, I mean, the, the inflation has he has dramatically uh, cut down the inflation. But still, there maybe fifty percent of of the population is under the line of poverty, which is extremely bad. And um, and uh, the aftermath of of the uh, of the decisions he he took in order to uh, cut down the inflation uh, are that the, the economy has. Uh, I mean, it was already bad, but now is uh, still is it hasn't uh, taken off. So it all depends, I guess, on on the coming six months or so. If if we see the uh, positive uh, trend that uh, Millet is expecting, then I think he has a, a fair chance of 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 uh, succeeding and uh, putting his uh, libertarian ideas uh, in 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 place. Yeah, I mean, what, one of the issues for him, though, right, is. He- one of the reforms is he's gotten a little rid of a lot of public sector yeah. employment, which mm-hmm. in the short term doesn't help, but in the long term potentially yeah, creates that means efficiency, a unemployment. cuts deficits, right? Yeah. Um, so he's he's kind of running against the clock. When 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 is his sort of re-election uh, um, period? There's a, there's a um, there's an election next year where um, it's, it's a, a Congress election, so mm-hmm. it's, it's not for the uh, executive. Uh, power but uh, on the congress so that's that is going to be like a, a very important test um, of kind of how things are trending yes so so with with that concept that you know i guess kind of the idea here is that we, you know we, we we understand that to correct a system you're going to kind of go through pain but for the enough of the people to realize that this is the right path i.e it's actually turned around and started doing better rather than worse it's not necessarily guaranteed that Malay is going to succeed, um, and you could end up in a, a government um, that that doesn't that sort totally. of is, reverses the yeah totally. the, the opening of markets and the reforms that he's been making. And in that, if if we go back to Binance as being these mechanisms and, and Lemon being these mechanisms, my uh, intuition would be they would quickly shut down those mechanisms as much as they could to make it as difficult as possible for capital to leave uh, the country. Yeah, that's that's probably, yeah, I, I agree with you. That's a, a potential outcome of this. Um, sometimes I like to think that uh, regardless, I mean, let's, if we assume for a minute that Millet will not succeed, then either way, he's doing part of, of the uh, dirty job that, no politician ever wanted to do so you never know what's uh, the, the next uh, party is going to do um because i mean politicians politicians are politicians so everyone knew regardless of of the public speech that uh, they had to um 
to decrease the size of, of the state and, and, and cut the, uh, the public employment uh, and things like that. So, for uh, I mean, he's doing that. And uh, I, I find it hard to believe that any politician will go back and, and, and take the uh, countermeasures measures for that. Yeah, w would you say it's fair? Maybe they wouldn't increase the size of government again, but they would want to reassert control over the currency? Um, I don't know. Um, I mean, Argentina, in its in its essence, uh, I don't I don't feel that uh, socialism and communism has so uh, strong roots. So that I I don't know. Like I, I'm I'm maybe I'm dreaming. I'm just fantasizing. But I I find it hard to believe that if Milei loses the, the next election. The, the, uh, whoever wins will go back uh, and take all the measures back. Um, I don't. F I really don't feel that 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 is a potential. Uh, it's a possibility. That, I mean, you never know. Yeah. So I mean, the thing I'm driving at, right, is if there isn't any sort of guarantees that the government will continue to like yeah. let you guys use crypto via these channels of having accounts with Binance. Uh, doing conversions with Lemon, et cetera. Um, if you actually had a crypto system where you could create your store of value and then use it on chain, once you exited that system, you wouldn't ever need permission to sort of go back. So if you could create the centralized exit rails, regardless of what the future government does, uh, you would still have access to crypto. That's right. Without needing their tacit approval of having Binance accounts and being able to convert pesos to Bitcoin and back and forth. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Um, yeah, I totally agree with that. So so it's an interesting market. Out of out of Buenos Aires, what percentage of people would you say have <clears throat> crypto? Out of Buenos Aires, uh, <laughs> very little. Um, like many other Latin American countries, population are highly concentrated in the big cities, not like here. So, uh, and also that goes together with uh, the level of uh, education that uh, people have. So, um, the more educated, they usually um, are more familiar with uh, how the economy works, and also uh, they 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 have more access to these uh, other means of, of ac um, having access to a uh, hard currency like using a crypto exchange. So out of Buenos Aires, I would say maybe, I don't know, 10% um, of, 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 of the people would, would know um, how to use it or even consider it uh, as an option. Okay. Maybe less than that. I've, I've heard numbers higher than that, but it's interesting to, to hear perception on the ground. Yeah, I mean, I could I could be wrong, but um, I'm thinking of the provinces where uh, and the small towns that were, I mean, where technology has not, it's maybe it's not so spread and uh, maybe twenty percent. Mm -hmm. What What do you think in in terms of just the economy? Um, right in the U.S., if you look at kind of our consumption patterns, um, majority of payments are digital. Uh, yeah. Right. They're card based and even moving away from cards to NFC tap sort of systems. Um, right. There's there's very, very little. Well, more and more, less and less cash is being used. Yeah. What, what kind of do you see as the breakdown right now in Argentina it's between the same for us, like card, phone, cash in terms of. No, we, uh, we payments? Um, I, I would say that we are pretty much at the same level as in here. Nobody's using cash. And you have to consider that uh, <laughs> when you have such a big inflation, and uh, meaning that um, the note, I mean, the the state has have not issued new uh, um, bills or notes for, oh, you for, can, a, you, for a long you, you time. You can't even have paper basically because uh, there's no paper you have that to, exists. It, you yeah, can't print it fast enough. Yeah, no, I, I not 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 only that, but I mean, if you want to go out and and pay for dinner, you have to carry with like a, with a, a bundle. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, that's one of the reasons why the digital payments have massively been a adopted. Yeah, no, it's 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 interesting when you see um, hyperinflation. There, there's actually. A <laughs> There's a couple of different ways they do they've done it where things hyperinflate so fast, right? They have to keep upping the denominations of bills 
And in some cases, it's like so quickly, they actually just like issue stamps. Yeah. They like add more zeros yeah. to sort of previously circulating bills. Yeah. Um, so they modify the own bill because they can't print fast enough to offset the, the valuation of the currency. Yeah. Uh, but but it makes sense that in, in an environment where it's actually physically challenging to both print and distribute bills to keep up with inflation, yeah, um, that most things would end up turning digital. So in in that digital spread, are you would, would you say most people use card? Most people use phones, um, or everybody that has a card has a phone um, and vice versa? No, I mean we have um, digital wallets, uh, not crypto wallets, but digital wallets or digital banks are really really. Uh, uh, accepted by by the population and i would say much more than crypto so um there's a big player in the region which is mercado libre which is like a competitor for 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 amazon and they actually compete in countries like in mexico i think uh but mercado libre they have a digital wallet which is accepted everywhere even in the most remote places okay so um but of course, uh, I mean that is that that's started to be heavily regulated and 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 watched by by the government. Is that functioning like a bank then? So you actually yeah. have a balance with them. Yes. Yeah. So it's not a credit based system. It's a yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, and, then, and then they have like some sort of how do you how do you get money into that account? Do you do it via like an ACH type thing or? Yes, yes. You, you, I mean, you can transfer for, from a regular bank account, but I mean, it's so uh, widely adopted that um, now everyone, uh, not everyone, but this I can tell you for sure that maybe, I don't know, like every time I, I get together with my friends and we, we, we get together for dinner and then we need to split the bill, Everyone, maybe what somebody pays with a credit card, and then the rest of us would transfer to him uh, using this digital wallet. What's the name of it again? Macab? Mercado Libre. Macala. Mercado Libre. Macalo. Mercado Libre. Free market. Libre. Okay. Uh, but there are other other examples as well. So uh, that is becoming increasingly popular. Interesting. I would I would say that. That's, I mean, the, the past two years, uh, the change in, in that has been uh, outstanding. Like, uh, yes. And, and that's, um, that's all peso denominated then? Yeah. So you can't, so it, it's, it's universally used yeah. as a peso denominated system. So then people have to, again, figure out sort of how to keep value of their pesos. Yeah. Um, or interconvert between like a store value and pesos, and then put it into the system. So it's a it's a ubiquitously used rail, but in pesos only. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's I mean that's the uh, account you would use for your daily expenses. And uh, yes, um, and and where where are they located? You said they're in. It, this is a a, um, a company that was funded by an Argentinian guy, but now it's all over Latin America. So do you think it's possible they would introduce dollar-denominated counts or that would be a step too far for the government? No, I, I don't think they uh, they will do that. Um, Mercado Libre, no, I don't know. I don't know. To be honest, I don't know. Because it sounds like if they did that, it would effectively uh, dollarize Argentina. Yes. Um, I mean, yeah, but that leads, leads us to um, another issue, which is... Um, the, the uh, state reserves in USD. So w one of the, uh, I mean, what Millet keeps promising is that he, at one point in the future, he will dollarize the economy. But it all depends on on, on the on the uh, USD reserves of, of the state, mm -hmm. which are still struggling. Um, so it's in his roadmap, but yes, hasn't hasn't been implemented. Yeah, interesting. Um, yes. So let's uh, you know maybe try to put a bow on this. What do you think the future of crypto is in Argentina? <laughs> I think in Argentina, uh, crypto has a bright future. To be honest, um, mainly um, for these two reasons that we were talking about. Uh, the biggest one being um, big cities is is widely adopted uh, as a as a mean to to access hard currency uh, and 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 to put your pesos uh change your pesos to a store of uh, to uh 
to uh, not not to to avoid losing value and also um the community of developers is is getting bigger and bigger so i think it's um the future is 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 uh it's a posit- it's a bright future for for crypto cool yeah well, I appreciate you taking the time. Let us know about life in Argentina and how crypto plays a role. Uh, and with that, I think we'll wrap it up. Thanks a lot. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, appreciate it.